So last week I released a short AI film called Dead Sea. It did pretty well on the usual social media rounds. It got some coverage in Forbes and spent two days as the top post on the OpenAI subreddit, which I did think was pretty funny considering you know, I didn't even use Sora. Do you think Sam Altman upvoted me or downvoted me? Now, a very nice recurring comment that I got across the various social media platforms was this is the best AI film yet. Now, to note, I don't think that's the case, and I would never say that. I don't have that Orson Welles egotistical streak, although I am not above using it as a quote. So today we're going to go through a full walkthrough of Dead Sea, how it was made, how much it cost, what works, and a frank discussion on what doesn't work. But first, let's do a quick screening just to get it in our heads. I'd say to go make some popcorn, but you know, it's only two minutes long, and honestly, it would take longer to make popcorn. Okay, let's roll it. So, why you be wanting to join a crew? Is it for the gold, or do I smell another reason? I feel I'm doomed if I stay on land. Damned, you say? Oh, lad. Let me tell you a story about being damned. Two years ago, the Tempest set out from Lundy. It was a brutal fog on the sea that day. An hour into the watch, the lookout called Prize. We ran her down like a shark. Her crew was a mangy lot. No fight in them. Since they didn't speak our tongue, they were no use to us for crew. So to the plank they went. It was odd. They went without pleading. None spoke, save one. Strigoi. The boys set to plunder in the wine and grog, but the ship held no cargo, save for one thing. How I wish we'd thrown it overboard, but alas, as night fell, the horror began. ended, there were but three left alive. Others had turned. It spoke but one word to me. Crew. And I said, I. So, still looking for a ship, boy. Ha 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 ha. If you change your mind, lad, just ask for Captain Renfield. I'm always looking for crew. So overall, I am pretty happy with the way it came out. The goal with Dead Sea was to push past AI film trailers and start moving into narrative scenes and stories. And I think it succeeded there. In terms of the story, someone did ask what LLM I used to craft the script. And to be honest, I actually didn't. Although I will say that I did lean on ChatGPT for some pirate lingo and just to confirm that everything was completely historically inaccurate. So although I didn't write this out as full script, I did know that the basic structure was going to be, you know, a flashback tale with two bookends. So I just immediately jumped in and started creating our characters. To accomplish this, I used Midjourney's dash dash C ref feature or character reference feature. The way that I like to approach this is to begin by creating a nine by 16 full bodied image of the character and then use that as our template. From there, I popped him into the scene. C-Ref is still not completely perfect, but you know, it's serviceable enough to get the job done. And once I'd landed on this image, I knew that this was going to be the one that I was going to lean on. Again, I do know that C-Ref definitely has some consistency problems, as we see in like the flashback sequences where our old Captain Redfield definitely puts on some weight. That said, I can always sell that one for narrative reasons. I mean, running a crew under a vampire master, I mean, it's gotta be a pretty stressful job. In order to maintain a fairly consistent look across the scenes, I did end up utilizing Midjourney's dash dash P or personalize function. If you are a Midjourney user and you haven't done this yet, I do highly recommend it. You simply head over to tasks and rank images. You'll need to rank 2000 images to get the ability to personalize. But at this point, I do have it pretty fine tuned to giving me more or less uh, photo real realistic or cinematic images. And I don't know why, but it's also just like super weirdly addicting to rate these images. When it came time for video, I did know that I wanted to use a combination of image to video and text to video. Text to video, namely focusing on Runways Gen 3. We'll talk about why in just a minute. But for now, focusing on the image to video aspect, the two models that I leaned pretty heavily on were Kling and LumaLab's Dream Factory. 
Again, with Kling, I know that a lot of you are having access issues. I might have something that helps coming up in just a bit. I think both Kling and Luma do a pretty good job when it comes to you know, kind of acting when provided with an input image. Giving them emotive prompts like talking happy or talking sad does seem to result in some pretty good stuff. That said, very specific actions can sometimes be a little bit on the frustrating side, as we see from our lookout here, who clearly does not understand how a spyglass works. And if you ask it to do too much, you can end up with some confusing, albeit hilarious results, like when I asked for the boy to get up and run away from the table, uh, and we got this as a result. Um, where yeah, he does it, eh, it just ends up turning into a completely different person. I also do like the fact that there's just like a random lady back here eating at the Pirate Tavern. You know she's giving the place a one star on Yelp. Interestingly, neither Kling nor Dream Factory would let me do the plank walking scene. Uh, instead, I would just end up with results that look like this, which I, admittedly is pretty hilarious. So there's always kind of this game that you're playing in the production where it's clear that the model is not going to do what you want it to do. So, you know, you're gonna have to make some creative concessions. And like with Below Bang Hua, the Korean horror trailer that I did with Dave Clark a few weeks ago, I did run into an issue with Kling just straight up refusing to generate a video. It was this coffin shot, which Kling was just like straight up, no, I'm not going to do that. Luma, on the other hand, had no problems with it. Now, for the attack sequence, I did know that I wanted to utilize text to video. Although it does tend to get, you know, warpy and decoherent, it also has a ton of energy. I do realize that this whole sequence is a bit of a wild swing and definitely does not work for everyone, but it was a very intentional choice on my part, namely because we're so early into all of this stuff. I mean, why not do weird experimental stuff? The base prompt for this came from Marco, AI and design, with VHS footage, found footage, zombie outbreak in the mall, shaky camera, analog video glitch, close up zombie face. So taking that base prompt and modifying it and running it in Gen 3 a lot of times, um, the results were, you know, usually a bit of a mess. But generally out of every two or three generations, I could usually find something that I could clip for the sequence. Like for example here, where our guy, you know, actually morphs into a vampire, that kind of worked for me. I did end up gacking up the footage a little bit more in the edit. Uh, you can see an adjustment layer here where I utilize bad TV reception, uh, an adjustment layer up here with sort of VHS distortion and then a couple of glitch effects here and there. I know overall the sequence isn't everyone's cup of tea. All I can say is that it's artistic choice on my part. I stand by it. Voices and sound effects were all handled by Eleven Labs. Captain Renfield's voice was actually a trained voice from a pal of mine's audition tape. He did ask me not to show the audition tape here, mainly because he's embarrassed by it. My original intention was to use the speech to text function in Eleven Labs in which I would you know, provide the voice and then it would change me into the pirate voice. But honestly, I was actually surprised at how good Eleven Labs is in contextually understanding the line that I'm looking for. As you can see here, most takes were like three to five lines before I landed on something that I really liked. How I wish we'd thrown it overboard, but alas, how I wish we'd thrown it overboard. But alas, how I wish we'd thrown it overboard. But alas. And again, for the sound effects, here is pirates on a ship laughing and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember if that's the one that I used or not. All I can say is that it makes me laugh as they laugh. Now that said, I will say that lip sync is probably the weakest aspect of the film. Now lip sync on our young lad did work pretty well utilizing Gen 3. I feel I'm doomed. If I stay on land. Not so much with Captain Renfield. I think between sort of the shadowy face and the beard, it was really having difficulty figuring out how to lip sync. Pika, unfortunately, did not fare much better. It just kind of looks like Captain Renfield is at a cattle auction. So ultimately, it came down to re-rolling him a number of times talking and then chopping up our audio and placing it into spots where it kind of made it look like he was talking. Uh, I would also have to play around with the speed between the clips to kind of line things up. Is it perfect? No, it is not. Is it passable? I mean, I think that if you're watching it on your phone, maybe. I mean, the shadows definitely do help a lot. I will say that all of this was done before a live portrait dropped, which I covered in the last video. Uh, that does look like that will help tremendously on this front. Rounding up, music was a combination of Udio and Suno. For the bulk of the piece, the underscore was provided by Udio. However, for the attack sequence, Udio would tend to alternate between other super atmospheric things or like just straight up metal. Whereas Suno really did understand the assignment. 
providing me with something that sounded very much like a cinematic action trailer cue. The final step was running the whole thing through Topaz to unify all of the frame rates, bring everything up to full HD, and just kind of like, smooth out some rough edges. From an aesthetic standpoint, someone mentioned that it looks to be around the level of a PlayStation 3 cutscene. I think that's a pretty fair assessment. If we take something like a cutscene from the PlayStation 3 version of The Last of Us and compare it to the same scene from the HBO adaptation, I would say that this lands you know, somewhere between those goalposts. As for the overall cost, and this is kind of a rough breakdown, uh, we have a mid-journey subscription at $30 a month. Runway is a bit tricky since I'm part of their creator program, and that means I can just generate, although I do get throttled at busy times. Uh, counting it up, though, I did about 42 versions of this prompt. So let's ballpark that at $80, even though I do think that the cost would actually end up being less. Luma has a $30 tier, 11 Labs is $10, and both Udio and Suno are free. We'll talk about getting access to Kling in just one second, but our base cost here is $158. Although realistically, you are looking at an additional $300 for Topaz. And to note, I am not factoring in, you know, my cost. Obviously, if I were to factor in the 14 hours that I spent on it, either in a daily or hourly rate, you know, the cost would be much higher. Know your worth, people. Still, even if we mark Kling at like an absurd price, like $100 a month, which again, I don't know if it's going to be that. And just running a super basic cost breakdown in terms of doing this in a traditional pipeline, uh, you might be looking at something like anywhere between $65,000 and $130,000 for a fully 3D animated version of this. Anywhere between $340,000 and $700,000 for a full-blown Hollywood production. And somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000 to $110,000 for like an indie version of it. But if there's one thing that no one can argue, it's the fact that I could not afford to pay for this using a traditional pipeline. There's no way that I could have done it in four days. At the end of the day, this was a short film to see if I could push myself past the AI trailer era. And to that, I do think the goal was accomplished. And now you pretty much have the ability to do all of this yourself. Kling access is still a bit on the wonky side right now. Although I will say that they did just recently launch a website. Now I'm not entirely sure how access is being doled out right now, but I do know that you can enter the website via a QR code utilizing your Kwai Shu account. This is something that we went over in the last Kling video. Additionally, Kling did say that they are working on getting wider access, so hopefully it won't be too long for you. In the meantime, I do think that you can still pull off most of this in Luma's Dream Factory. So I am very much looking forward to seeing your movies. I thank you for watching. My name is Tim.